Right now, it's about 330 million years ago. The Earth is in the Carboniferous period. At the time, much of the Earth was covered in a biome that is now foreign to us. These coal forests were muddy, humid, and full of oxygen. It was a perfect storm of conditions that created two things in excess at this time. Coal and giant arthropods. This is Hippodopterus, one of the largest arthropods to ever live. Hyperdopterus was the second Eurypter to ever be discovered, but it saw a renewed surge of interest following the discovery of a six meter long trackway made by an animal that used to live in what is now Fife, Scotland. These tracks were composed of about four main parts. Three pairs of legs on either side, a hexapodal stance implied by body fossils of Hibbert, and a much heavier midline created by the large telson that dragged behind it as it moved. We can tell by the leg tracks that the animal was moving just incredibly slow. The tracks are clear, unambiguous evidence that Hibridopterus and indeed some other Eurypterids could traverse small stretches of land for a brief amount of time, but they weren't very good at it. It didn't walk so much as it dragged itself across the mud. Not an easy task for one of the world's heaviest arthropods. While a few Eurypterids were easily longer than Hibbert, they probably weren't heavier. The tracks in Fife were made by an animal about 1.6 meters long, and a meter long at its widest. Not to mention the height of the animal. Hibridopterus was significantly more robustly built than other Eurypterids, which mostly stuck with a flatter profile. Larger examples of Hippodopterus in this area could have reached about 2 meters in length. Acutiramus and Carcinosoma both exceed 2 meters in length, and Jacolopterus pushes 2.5 meters. However, further trackway evidence from South Africa seems to indicate one species of Hippodopterus might have reached about the same size as Jacolopterus. So, We've established that Hippodopterus was lumbering across a stretch of mud through some far-off Carboniferous swamp, but now we have a question. Why would a giant, heavy, aquatic arthropod do that? Hippodopterus was a complex animal and has vexed me in writing this. Hibridopterus, against the popular vision of Eurypterids, was a freshwater animal, as were the vast majority of Eurypterids, living in fresh or brackish waters of different kinds as they aged. Hibridopterus is actually a juvenile of the animal. The genera Dunsopterus and Zertostenus represent adults. But because Hibridopterus was among the earliest named Eurypterids in history, its name takes priority over its youth and elder forms, leaving us with three different animals now synonymized into one, changing as it grew. Hippodopterus and Certostenus are the only forms that preserve the feeding appendages that made this animal a sweep feeder. The feeding appendages of Hippodopterus, the young adult form, were blunt. The first two feeding appendages, limb pairs 2 and 3, bore small, movable blades, themselves covered in sensory hairs, setae that became more densely packed the further down the blade. These hairs would have been used to rake the sediment, looking for small animals hidden in the silt and mud, 
animals like small arthropods or gastropods like snails. These animals would eventually be brushed into the mouth. But here's where ontogeny comes into play, the development from young to old. Certostenus had a markedly different strategy. Fossils of Certostenus show that the feeding appendages formed comb-like structures, lined with fine, flexible setae, packed so closely together that they could trap and collect prey much smaller than Hippodopterus ever could. On one side of the appendage, these rachis structures filtered prey as small as algae and microscopic diatoms, while on the other side of the appendage, motile spines would scrape the combs and brush the suspended particles into the mouth. The diet and feeding strategy of Cerdostenus is not dissimilar from Andean flamingos, which primarily eat diatoms from just at the substrate interface where mud meets water. The discovery of Pentacopterus, named by James Lamsdell for the Greek warship, demonstrated that this massive change through growth in feeding strategy and even anatomy was not entirely out of the ordinary. The body shape of Hippodopterus itself also changed during this growth cycle. Hippodopterus fossils, the ones in that mid-range of growth, are believed to mostly represent molts, exuviae, of a growing animal, explaining why they tend to be more intact than its larger counterpart, which is frequently found disarticulated. These mostly represent casualties. As it aged, the eyes moved upward and closer together. A large spade-like extension of the head developed as a way to protect the filtering appendages from above and make molting easier by giving the sutures more space and grooves developed along the appendages. The gradual shifting of the eyes is seen in other Eurypterids, and the grooves of the legs are seen as enlarged muscle attachment points, affording the adults more strength to bear their own weight. Our friend Hippodopterus, from its home near to Fife and Kirkton Lake of old, was dragging its body through a swamp to travel to more fertile grounds, in search of food, a mate, or some other worldly desire. Other Eurypterids have been indirectly noted to perform this task. Stylonurine Eurypterids, a group to which Hybridopterus also belongs to, from the Strud locality of Belgium, lived in different habitats as they aged. Juvenile specimens were found frequently in rocks corresponding to low-energy floodplains and ephemeral pools, while larger, more fragmentary specimens were recovered from rocks which represent the bed of a high-energy fluvial body an ancient rushing river which ripped up the remains of once rugged Eurypterids. At some point in the transition from young to old, the teenaged arthropods must have made the switch from calm pools to violent, more fruitful riverbeds, and the switch was made over land. Originally, Eurypterids would have only come into these more freshwater environments to molt safely, but during the Devonian period, the earth was changing. Things were getting hotter, most of Earth's landmass was located closer to the equator, and the higher temperatures incidentally made low saline environments easier to handle, not only for Eurypterids, but chasmataspids and horseshoe crabs as well. Hippodopterus in its strange beauty and ultraviolet reflecting carapace, in its squalor among the pond scum of a primordial swamp, died out some time in the middle of the Carboniferous. It was an oddity of prehistory, and the world may have seen nothing like it at any other point so long as this planet has drifted through the stream of finite time. Eurypterids in all their diversity are to be admired, as too are so many of the animals small and traitorously accused by man of being lesser. From lobopods, those pioneers of our world, to the smallest grub living among the leaves of a Cretaceous rainforest. They are not mighty, rarely glamorous, but just as important as even the largest of sauropods and whales. They're simply modest about it. But I will admit, it is fun to talk about the big ones sometimes. I'm Prehistorica. Thanks for watching. Massive animal inside of me and it's so 
ugly and I'm so broken and I'm so ugly and it's